So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on a Saturday morning. My name is Shubham, and I'm a vice curator and the moderator for the second session of the third Indian Law Conclave. Today, we have an amazing panel with us who will be shedding some light on the post-COVID world. Before we dive into the panel introductions, I'd like to quickly brief you all about the structure of the session, just to simply give you an idea of what to expect. The session is divided into three parts. In the first part, each speaker will share their thoughts on the topic for about 10 minutes. In the second part, I will ask questions to the panel and drive discussions toward, towards unearthing the mysteries of post-COVID world. In the final part, we will take a few questions from the audience. Make sure to type your question in the Zoom chat box using the screen icon below. Lastly, do not hesitate to share your thoughts on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And also don't forget to use the hashtag Indian Law Conclave. If you have any technical issues during the session, please send us a WhatsApp message to 75887078864. You may also find the number pinned in the Zoom chat box. Sounds good? All right. So without wasting a moment, I'll start the session by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Bharti. Dr. Bharti currently serves as a professor of law and director of the Center for Environmental Law, Policy and Research at the National University of Delhi. She was also a visiting faculty at the Institute of Constitutional and Parliamentary Studies and the Parliamentary Research and Training Institute for Democracies, also known as PRIDE in Delhi. Our second speaker for today is Mr. Dhruv Singhal. He started as a partner designate at Sairil Amarchand Mangal Das in 2007 and later on moved to AZB and Partners Corporate Law Firm to become a partner. He returned to CAM in 2019 as a partner and presently works there. Mr. Singhal specializes mainly in cross-border mergers and acquisitions and private equity work. Our last speaker for this session, Ms. Vinita Hariharan, is a leading public policy specialist presently serving as the chief of the externally aided missions of the Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises of the Government of India. As yet, Ms. Hariharan has started six competitiveness programs under the National Monitoring and Implementation Unit. Ably, she has anchored several externally aided programs, namely for the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Credit and Stahl Fuel Weeder of Bau, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, to name a few. Very recently, she was awarded the Women of Excellence Award by the very coveted India Achievers Forum. For more information on the speakers, please refer to the Delegate Handbook. Thank you so much for joining us at the Third Indian Law Conclave. We are glad to have you with us, panelists. So shall we begin the conversation? All right, starting with you, Ms. Hariyar, and would you like to open the panel discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so thanking the Indian Law Conclave for having me here as a speaker and congratulations for your third Law Conclave. I had the privilege of attending the first or the second, I think, in person. So I'm uh, very impressed by the young, enterprising youth and contributing to nation building and also the eclectic set of advisors that you have. Uh, so coming to the topic of uh, post-COVID-19 world order, very, very extremely relevant. Uh, we're all living through this uh, crisis at the moment. And uh, this pandemic has actually taken the global health and civic systems by complete shock and the scale and impact has been unprecedented. Uh, the onslaught is indeed a black swan event and has found the world even the most powerful and uh, technologically advanced nations uh, grossly underprepared for this. So I would just like to take a, a, you know, a brief uh, uh, introduction about what, what are the kind of policy measures that one needs to take or one, is, one takes during such pandemic. So I'll focus the first introductory session on that. Uh, so if you talk of the post-COVID-19 projections for countries across the globe, uh, projections that are, are not very uh, optimistic. Uh, it is estimated that the, you know, the advanced nations like the US and UK are quite likely to experience deeper and longer lasting effects, while China is likely to come out much stronger, at least 50% better than uh, these countries. And the odds for the Euro area are also ske uh, skewed negatively, but uh, it is uh, predicted that the Euro area would actually uh, come out much faster than the US by the uh, likely by the end of 2021 and pulled by China, the rest of emerging Asia has a higher chance of performing better than the global average. So non-Asian emerging markets also stand out particularly for their vulnerability like the Latin American countries as we all see. 
And uh, the other emerging markets, which is the Turkey, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia, will also certainly see at least eight quarters of severely depressed economic activity. So these are the kind of doomsday predictions uh, for the post-COVID-19 world order. Sorry to begin the lecture with this, but it's important to take cognizance of the reality that we are, uh, we are faced with today. So this just goes on to prove that the fallout of the pandemic because of interconnections and the global nature of the shock, it just goes on to prove that there needs to be very, very robust policy measures which interconnects the globe and not just for any particular country per se. So if you look at the kind of policy responses that are required for such pandemics, there are two kinds of policy responses. One is reactive and the other is uh, proactive. So reactive is the kind of measures that all of us have taken, all the countries across the globe have taken for want of any other uh, uh, measures that we know of, because this pandemic has also taken the whole globe by uh, complete shock. So lockdown, so these was, that was the knee-jerk reaction, the knee-jerk policy, the reactive policy measure that uh, most countries took, which uh, have uh, severe economic fallouts. But there was nothing better that any other country could do at that point of time. And providing fiscal stimuli, that's another reactive policy measure, which is, uh, uh, which is essential. And we've seen uh, across the globe the kind of uh, uh, liquidity that has been pumped in. Uh, it has been, uh, it has been, it has surpassed all previous records and it has been almost in excess of 2% of the world product. So, which is uh, actually greater than the financial crisis of 2008-9, greater than the response to the financial crisis of 8-9. But these are knee-jerk, again, these are knee-jerk reactive measures. So what are the kind of medium-term and long-term measures that one needs to take to prevent such knee-jerk reactions, which actually dent uh, fiscal capacities across the globe? So in the medium term, we need to actually uh, look at pro uh, promoting a redirection of resources to activities that are feasible during such pandemics. For example, like the reskilling and retraining of our small businesses and the uh, Mahatma Gandhi Narega workers uh, to manufacture the ventilators and PPE kits, which the government then subsequently act did. Uh, you know, it, they worked in that direction. And uh, we could also look at redesigning our automobiles to more personalized modes and designs. So we look forward to automobile giants now coming forward with niche designs, which could actually uh, work during such pandemics also. Uh, like for example, the shields for the cars, et cetera. So these are some kind of uh, nuances or subtle design changes, which automobile giants would need to come out with for their uh, automobiles to, uh, coming forth uh, henceforth. And if you look at the sectors of tourism and retail, these are the two sectors which have been dented extremely uh, badly during this pandemic and suffered the most. While retail has adapted itself quite well to uh, this uh, adverse, react uh, adverse circumstances by uh, ad adopting the digital platforms most effectively. But the tourism sector, it's still to uh, make use of the digital platforms so effectively, where while the government of India, the Ministry of Tourism has done an excellent job of uh, actually have holding these webinars every Sunday. I don't know if uh, any of you would have had the chance to go through to see these webinars. So one of my friends, the Director General there in the Tourism Ministry, and she actually conducts these webinars every Sunday, uh, which actually uh, uh, takes the uh, it takes people uh, through the heritage of India. The, they they uh, talk about the culturally rich uh, states and places that are uh, hitherto undiscovered. Uh, so this actually uh, retains interest of the people in, on, uh, you know, in tourism. And so therefore, post COVID-19, we would see a larger uh, uh, uptake of such uh, tourism activities. So that's, a, that's something which uh, the tourism players also would need to perhaps look at how they could make this a revenue model and how they could adopt such digital platforms to during this uh, uh, pandemic can um, per per perhaps you know generate uh, revenues out of such uh, modes. So, uh, so, so therefore, COVID nineteen, post COVID nineteen, we would need to uh, be uh, you know uh, uh, all sectors across sectors. We, there needs to be versatility in switching between interactive and distance chain, distance distance chains. So that is that's going to be uh, permanently essential. So when you talk of long run measures, so the finding the long run, uh, every governance unit would need to focus on saturating their health facilities in their respective administrative uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, saturating with, res with reference to diagnostics, primary, secondary, and tertiary healthcare facilities, and uh, ramping up the research and development efforts and facilities, and spending on health across governments have, has to be increased exponentially. And uh, we are abysmally low on an average across 
across the globe when it comes to per capita health spending. So that really needs to be spruced up and government really needs to look and prioritize budgets across sectors while, uh, while reducing spending on uh, possible man-made disasters like wars and, and the defense uh, related uh, expenditure and focusing more on increasing the health spend. Because a health spend might look like a social spend at the moment, but it is actually a long-term economic investment because the lack of it is what we are facing today. The economic fallouts of the lack of adequate investments on in health uh, in the earlier uh, times is what uh, the fallouts that the entire globe is uh, facing today. And of course, we need to really invest a lot on data availability. Data availability is a huge problem in many of many countries, including ours. So we really need to focus our investments in R&D on improving our database so that we are able to actually predict such pandemics, just like the way we've got prowess in predicting weather forecast, the weather disasters, disasters related to weather, we've, we've, we've had some kind of traction in that. Similarly, we need to have that kind of prowess in predicting pandemics. And uh, 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 lastly, we can't have a policy monoculture in uh, policy responses to such pandemics. Like we can't have a top-down centrally driven policies for such pandemics. So, because every local uh, area, every region, every district, or every sub uh, subnational provincial government's context would be different. Therefore, policies would have to be tailor-made to the particular local uh, and regional uh, context. And of course, leadership plays an extremely important role, which we've seen across the globe. Uh, very uh, dynamic leaders have been able to control the pandemics in their countries with very uh, friendly and uh, at the same time, very effective uh, policies against the, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, coping up with this uh, pandemics. And finally, what is the impact of this pandemic on the sustainable development goal agenda, which uh, we were all uh, marching towards? Uh, so I think the first uh, sustainable development goal is poverty, which has been extremely uh, impacted. Uh, the uh, sustainable development goal in food security, health, economy or uh, reduced inequalities and of course multilateralism has also been impacted quite adversely uh, with this uh, pandemic so uh, so that's that's about the policy uh, frameworks and uh, with reference to this pandemic yeah thank you so i'll hand it over to the other panelists thank you so much for for your insights uh, ms hariharan now we move on to mr singhal would you like to make your opening statements Uh, could you unmute yourself, Mr. Singhal? Yes. Thank you, Shivam. Thank you, Vinita. I think uh, I would uh, take a slightly different perspective or outlook to Vinita's. I think she comes from a, a public policy where she needs to address, uh, rightly so, the situations which are uh, causing us, uh, you know, a stress. As a as a uh, corporate lawyer, my outlook is a little more positive and a little more optimistic. Uh, I see the opportunities which we create. And I think every calamity you know, brings with it two things. It forces us to undertake uh, much needed reforms. And it brings about new opportunities. Uh, so a calamity not, is not always, uh, I mean, it, of course, there is a human uh, loss to it. There's economic loss to it, which, uh, but we are today emerging out of it. It is not something, it, it should not become the focus of our uh, every discourse of ours. It should not become the focus of every uh, discussion of ours. I think we need to understand that a calamity is nothing but a catalyst for some fundamental changes in social economic culture, policies and outlooks in our economy. And MA is no exception to that, right? Uh, ultimately, MA is nothing but a businessman doing business, uh, you know, in not a vacuum, but in context of their uh, environment, in context of their socioeconomic environments, in geopolitical environments. And so you must see MA and economy in that, in that light. COVID-19, I think, is no different, right? We today are in an economy which is impacted by a pandemic that has fundamentally changed our outlook towards how we do business, how we uh, react. It has forced us to look inwards in multiple ways, right? It's not just one paradigm, it's multiple paradigms, whether macro level, uh, geopolitical level, micro level, or even personal level. And that impacts the way we have been doing business. Starting a macro level, uh, it is now today a need for self-sustainability. You have limited interactions with uh, your uh, 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 economic partners overseas. Imports have become uh, uh, lesser. Exports have reduced. You need to now look at uh, domestic demand as a fundamental catalyst to your economic growth. At the micro level, 
uh, each company uh, looking at each company level each company is realizing the need for a more uh, sustainable development or sustainable a long term sustainable uh, uh, system right as against being short term benefits they now realize that they have to be sustainable in the approach if you're not sustainable you will necessarily in the next pandemic or the next uh, calamity you will possibly lose out and that also reflects at personal level right we have now been looking at reskilling there has been of course a large unemployment in the last 9 months 8 months but that has also led to a uh, people looking inward to see what they want to do in life changing priorities at a personal level reskilling for what they have always wanted to do getting out of the inertia of what they want should have been done or want to do to now what they are doing and that is reflected in how we are doing business today uh for example because of the large unemployment today there is a shift towards a greater amount of self employment that then falls back into how government has been making policies with it right and today what we are doing with our businesses uh look at the reform which we have undertaken there is uh, today a, a correction in real estate there, there was a real estate bubble since 2007 and that has today broken the market has crashed but is that necessarily bad not necessarily so right because today supply is becoming more constrained towards what the demand is for rather than being a blockage of supply just being flushed into the market developers are forced to take a look back at what they really want there is now impetus towards uh, projects like warehousing and logistics projects rather than only housing and commercial real estate work from home has resulted in people now looking at the need for office spaces is that necessarily bad not really because what it does is allows redirection of investment resources in area that are going to be futuristic looking has real estate uh, entirely uh, been affected no you have had some significant deal like mind space uh, business park reit which has happened at a, a, a substantial premium google is looking to invest uh, billions of dollars into the economy including real estate hdfc and metlife have come out with stressed asset funds so there is a covid doesn't bring about just uh, destruction it's i think it what it presents to us is a tactical shift in our requirements we are today moving towards more essential services we are moving towards more uh, sectors which are focused on providing primary services if you see the uh, fdi uh, uh, data in the last 6 7 months uh we have actually done almost as well as 2019 in terms of overall fdi but why that is because there has been a shift towards the sectors which we focus on today the, the uh, most of the fdi is coming into telecom uh into healthcare into e-commerce right which is basically creating what's creating a basic infrastructure it is creating your telecommunication capabilities is improving your healthcare improving your retail and logistics and that is where today the fo uh, focus is going on from being from earlier where uh, the emphasis was on luxury items today is moving towards essential items and this reflects also in the way we are doing mna in india uh, this is not simply a, a macroeconomic outlook but this reflects into your mna as well today we are moving into consolidatory market because of this there is a greater uh, uh, pandemic has uh, probably exposed more than ever before the difference between haves and have nots it does not mean that it is a situation simply where uh, the have nots are suffering it's also resulting in a consolidation people with high liquidity are, are, are going to prosper going forward people who have high liquidity can also do, do acquisitions as there's, there's an, a huge case you made for stress acquisitions a huge case you made for vertical and horizontal alignments and and uh, uh, consolidations you will have situations where the larger players who are going to thrive going forward right they are going to consume with themselves the smaller players but that creates that creates a more surplus into the smaller players it reduces their stress on them allows them to focus their energy in some into different areas it also allows for greater startups which is also a, a, a large shift in the government policy all of this is also be seen in context of the geopolitical environment today we are moving in uh, away from china uh apart from the not only pandemic but also the current uh, us china uh, trade war right that resulting in today a growing focus away from china in towards india and we are today poised to be in a situation where we can possibly cap capitalize on it whether it is samsung uh, uh looking to take uh, advantage of the plis into the electronic consumer market whether it is iphone coming to look into uh, coming to india whether it is uh, uh 
the German uh, German footprint make, maker. All of them are looking to capitalize on the movement away from China. Japan has introduced policies and and impetus for uh, companies which move away from China and go to other Asian countries. U.S. is setting up uh, 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 lobbying groups for going against China, and India is today set to take advantage of that. Uh, government's impetus on MSMEs, they have uh, today they redefined what MSMEs mean. They've increased the uh, thresholds at which you can call a default on MSMEs. They've given tax benefits to MSMEs. The startup regulations come into place, which have given uh, benefit to uh, the tax benefit for startup regime for three years. There is a multitude of policy changes and regulations which are affecting m and And today, investment, therefore, focusing towards these sectors. So it is focusing to startups. Private degree funds worldwide are setting with $2.9 trillion of dry powder. That is, that's not going waste. It is going towards sectors which are being refocused. So there is now a refocus in what we are doing. There is now a movement away from inertia. It is breaking the inertia which we've had and is bringing realignment into what is today the outlook for the new, the new normal. There is now a growing uh, tendency to have employers uh, bring about uh, uh, models which are, is a new form of capitalism, right? What we call stakeholder capitalism. Today, that's becoming more and more advanced. Companies have taken a back, have taken a step back to see whether uh, a short-term gain by depriving the employees of the benefits of employment laws is helpful. Uh, Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, uh, uh, Gujarat, Karnataka tried coming out with legislations to uh, attract investors by uh, reducing on the uh, labor laws. All of them today have pulled it back. They've realized sustainable development is more important and is the need of the hour uh, than a short-term capital gains. So I think in that light, uh, the way we are seeing MA uh, happening, MA is happening uh, to give a, 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 a brief uh, background to what is happening in the country today. We are seeing a lot of MA activity. We are seeing a lot of uh, private equity activity. It is just refocused into different sectors, into the sectors they believe are going to be sectors of future. And they're now taking the time into making sure there's a valuation gap is taken care of. There are various ways in which valuation methodologies and, and gaps are being addressed. There is now a, a greater focus towards ensuring that there, uh, there is more impetus given on diligences, on making sure uh, people take the time in uh, evaluating companies properly. If you see 2007, 2008, when there was a, uh, the height of the boom, valuations were dangerously high. And that resulted in the next five years where exits were not easy to come, and therefore resulting in the, uh, in the meltdown uh, post-2013. Today, that is correcting. With, that, with real estate correcting, with markets correcting, with uh, economic policies correcting, there's a valuation correction as well. That results in deal happening greater. The people have looking at earnout possibilities. The valuation gaps are being met through earnouts. So there is business and m and is adjusting to the need of the hour. And I think opportunity is there. We just need to be able to capitalize it and move up policies and our outlook in the right direction. Thank you so much for a positive start, Mr. Singhal. Now the floor is all yours, Madam Bharti. Yeah, uh, I would like to extend my thanks to <clears throat> Indian Law Conclave uh, for this uh, interactive uh, session. And I've been present in the earlier two sessions and I've, uh, it's been um, absolutely fantastic being part of it. Uh, so uh, just moving away from the policy, public policy perspective and the corporate sector perspective, uh, it's environmental perspective, which I would be uh, just, uh, you know, dwelling on. And uh, it's it's really something to, you know, it's slightly Nostradamic, you know, the way the uh, ominous uh, portents have been there. And especially in the environmental sector, it's a kind of SOS call because environment is uh, a factor in uh, the pandemic. And it is also, um, uh, there are outcomes that are there for environment due to the pandemic. Uh, it is uh, very significant to realize that uh, there's a high high level of interconnectedness, you know, when we're talking about environment. And it has unraveled during the course of this crisis, how it has emerged center stage. Uh, we find that uh, there are many areas of concern that have emerged during this. And, uh, you know, uh, whether it is wildlife protection or and the related, um, uh, the encroachment uh, on the natural habitats, uh, the the kind of deforestation, the Amazon fires, the uh, the you know the, the condensing of the natural habitat spaces, uh, which have really led to 
uh, the the kind of uh, the interface that has come up between the wildlife, uh, you know, the the zoonotic diseases that have now emerged in this process, and which are going to be the way for the future as it has been, um, you know, projected. So there are certain important uh, takeaways, um, very very significant ones, and some of them are, and 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 you know, this is this is also to do with uh, uh, the entire set of uh, countries how they are trying to tackle. Uh, the preventive measures, the proactive measures, and the remedial measures. Uh, preventive measures are certainly much more effective and uh, then the remedial measures and the cost is projected to be 500 times more in the remedial measures as compared to the preventive measures. Uh, the problems have come up that have emerged are particularly with respect to the vulnerable communities. And uh, these are the indigenous communities. These might be the uh, the, the kind of gender bias that is seen during the course of the pandemic, um, how women have suffered. And uh, not only uh, there, is, there have been um, increase in the cases of domestic violence and um, other um, uh, problems, you know, whether it is access to um, uh, health facilities with respect to women, the ethnic groups um, and, and the other kind of, uh, there have been uh, the project, the, uh, the identification of many indigenous tribes in the uh, Amazon region, 34 indigenous tribes that have suffered, that have also, uh, you know, because of the uh, loss of livelihoods and the loss of uh, their own spaces. Uh, so there has been uh, the emergence of a principle of regression, which has been witnessed uh, in the course of dealing with the pandemic across the nations of the world. And this is a cause of uh, concern. So whether it is uh, in terms of environmental clearances or um, you know the other uh, environmental laws, and basically the principle of non-regression applies, wherein the basic threshold is set in terms of the legal framework, and uh, any kind of decimation or uh, you know uh, the the kind of going downwards is is to be avoided in any manner. And uh, however, what is noticed is that because of the pace of uh, the, the, the kind of anxiety of various countries to uh, deal with poverty, with uh, the, the issues of medical care and so on. Uh, the whole uh, race towards development has been uh, a bit more accelerated. And this has also resulted in many of the uh, existing laws being tempered with. So there is, uh, there are of course certain heartening features which have been uh, observed during during this pandemic, which is improvement, say, in the water bodies, improvement in air pollution levels. Although when we see in Delhi and the surrounding NCR regions, uh, there's a problem of uh, extreme, uh, you know, particulate matter, which is observed during this season. Uh, but nonetheless, there are these, uh, there is greater freedom of wildlife, you know, to move around. But at the same time, you find that there are, because the tourism sector, which has been referred to earlier, that has suffered a lot. And because of that, there is lesser personnel and lesser funding and lesser finances which are available uh, for the protection of the uh, protected spaces, the, the national parks and the sanctuaries and so on. So essentially, when we are outlining all these problems, <clears throat> we may come to certain uh, set of measures that are imperative. One of them is to recognize the right to environment as a specific uh, uh, you know, part of aspect of human rights and, and, and to be explicitly recognized and not as only a dimension of right to life. So this is something which is, um, which is, which is really at the, at the uh, global committee of nations. Uh, there is a need for it to, uh, for this recognition. The uh, sustainable development goals agenda. So there are many, many, uh, uh, conferences and summits which are on the anvil. And there is the Conference of Parties 26 of the United Nations uh, uh, framework on the, uh, the Convention of Climate Change, which is due now. It has been shifted in Glasgow in uh, next year in November. Uh, there is also the Con Convention on Biodiversity, which is to take place in China next year. Uh, so there, there are all these, uh, you know, these uh, very landmark events that are going to incorporate uh, the basic strategies that the, the world would envisage 
to deal with the pandemic and with the environmental issues uh, that have emerged. The sustainable development goals that partake of the three complements of um, uh, the economy, environment, and society. Uh, these are uh, the 17 goals, and out of these, at least seven of them have a very direct connect with the environment. Uh, so there, there has been a certain, uh, you know, uh, definitely the, there has been a problem in, in uh, relation to them. And the problem of waste has emerged very significantly uh, due, during the course of this pandemic uh, due to the use of, when we talk about PP equipment or masks and so on. So there's been such an accumulation of plastic waste and there's no knowing how to deal with it. So these are, uh, there is, it is very important to involve all the stakeholders uh, in the, you know, for the purpose of, of dealing with the various issues that have come up. And a lot of smart investment is needed, whether it is for the purposes of research or rethinking agricultural practices, um, including livestock, uh, because uh, when we are talking about, you know, uh, you know, encroaching upon land for, for the purposes of clearing it for agriculture or for livestock maintenance, then there is uh, you are you are definitely transcending uh, the areas meant which which are which are there for the nat for the wildlife and for the uh, you know uh, for their uh, survival. Uh, there is also the inequalities that have emerged very really strongly, and these inequalities are of income, of gender, of ethnic ethnicity, of uh, between nations, rich and and the the haves and the have-nots and the north and the south nations. And there is a need to address all these in a manner which is uh, reflecting the wisdom and innovative strategies for the future. Uh, so climate change, which is a very major theme of environment uh, in the present, uh, it, it, is in, in, you know, it is intrinsically linked uh, with, the, with the problem, uh, with the present problem also. And uh, you find that the differences in temperature and the differences in the rainfall patterns and the extreme events that take place due to, uh, due to climate change, due to you know, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, uh, they, have, they are reflected in the kind of emergence of pandemics that are presently there. So uh, there is a need to really correlate, coordinate, to redesign, reverse, rethink uh, on the very intricate uh, this the connect between man and nature and to make it possible for the survival of life on earth thank you thank you so much dr Bhatt, for sharing your thoughts now we move on to our next segment that is of question and answers so my first question is directed at mr single in the aftermath of the global financial crisis Indian private equity investments fell nearly by 70% in 2009 from the peak seen in 2007. As per EY's initial estimates, Indian private equity will witness a reduction of estimation, an approximate 45 to 60% in 2020 from 2019 levels. Private equity exits are also expected to shrink a staggering 50 to 60% lower than the previous year. While there is a still a lot of uncertainty around the future trajectory of COVID-19 in India, a full understanding of its ramifications on the global and Indian economy um, is unknown. So my question to you is, how have private uh, capital investors reacted to this unforeseen event and to the economic upheaval it brings in its wake? Are we going to witness a significant reduction in Indian private equity? And what ramifications would it bring for the Indian standing in the global economic architecture? So uh, I think that perspective is a little myopic. Private equity investors are uh, not investors who are investing for one year or six months, right? They're looking to make a five year to seven year long investments. It, I think, is healthy that there is a pause periodically in the amount of investments which are made uh, by PE firms because what that allows for is allows for people to take a step back and look at the uh, and reevaluate the criteria on the basis of which they're making an investment. Like I said earlier, there is a $2.5 trillion of dry powder sitting with private equity funds. So there's no liquidity crunch. What the PE funds are not doing, and I think rightly so, is they're reevaluating the sectors into which they want to invest. And they're looking at how to cover the valuation gaps. There is a greater uh, 
emphasis on selecting the right assets rather than making a run uh, for just uh, uh, in, in a cattle herd to buy any asset, asset that's available. I don't think it's correct to say that there is necessarily a contraction. There was surely a contraction up till the month of June. Uh, but if you see in, uh, and I think that that time the contraction was nearly 60% from the previous quarter and the previous financial year. But if you see data as of August and August end, that is, we have actually recovered uh, significantly better. Uh, we have, uh, as compared to last year, $50 billion of investments in the country. Uh, this uh, year to date investments are already $35 billion. $20 billion coming only in the month of July, August. Of course, a large part of the investment is thanks to Reliance. Uh, you know, the uh, deals both in the retail sector as well as the deals in telecom sector. But that is simply emphasizing that this, there's no absence of liquidity with the in investors. There is simply a realignment of where they believe they should be investing the capital into. There is a large uptake in e-commerce sector. Uh, we, currently, itself, I think there are almost every banker in the country has a two or three e-commerce deals running with them. Every law firm in the country has. 10, 20 uh, 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 e-commerce running uh, at any given point of time, right? So there is not, and there's also a tactical shift in how uh, PE funds are approaching uh, investments. It's no longer simply a financial investment for a financial gain. They're looking to take controlling stake. Large funds like KKR and others have uh, become controlling stakeholders. Blackstone is becoming controlling stakeholder. They're taking now strategic interests into various uh, investments. They're looking to uh, make sure that the value that they give to the shareholders or the promoters uh, is uh, backed by a performance, which is a post facto performance. So an earnout is becoming a way of uh, de-risking themselves. They're making sure stencil coverings are taken care of. They're ensuring uh, a greater amount of uh, impetus is given to the strategic thinking behind decision-making. So there is now a tactical shift in how PEs are doing the business. It is not just a, a bleak scenario where PEs are not making investments in or there is simply a contraction as numbers would suggest. So the data needs to be seen in light of what it actually brings about or you know what it actually reflects. It's not simply a contraction uh, and you know which will result in a liquidity crunch. We have to look at sectors which uh, will attract a large amount of private equity. Uh, like I said again, telecom, edtech, e-commerce, healthcare, financials. Right, these are the backbone of the industry of the economy, infrastructure, and in, there is no dearth of private equity in these. There is a uh, private equity coming even manufacturing sector now, which has actually been uh, a, a factor missing from the economy for the last few years, but that's coming in now. So there is refocusing, but not dearth. Thank you so much for such an informative answer, Mr. Singhal. My Next question is directed to uh, Ms. Hari Haran. So my second question is, uh, in the light of an unprecedented pandemic, global energy partnerships with various countries in the area of clean technology, renewable energy, petroleum, and natural gas will play an important role in economic recovery. Initiatives like International Solar Alliance and execution of solar energy projects in other countries through lines of credit can enhance India's international presence in the new and renewable energy sector. So my question to you is, ma'am, how relevant do you find this development in the post-COVID world? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is all the more relevant, actually, in a post-COVID-19 world where uh, we have to really refocus our investments and our policies towards uh, clean infrastructure and green infrastructure, which actually the government uh, of the day is also focusing on proactively. Even before post-COVID-19, they were uh, actually, there was a huge thrust in solar and renewable energy, and there were huge targets that were set uh, for 2022 achievement. And I think they've gone ahead uh, with quite a good pace towards uh, achieving their renewable energy targets. But, uh, uh, but when it comes to actually percolating that to at a very basic uh, unit level, there, there needs to be a lot done at, as in the movement, you know, like uh, countries like Bangladesh, et cetera, have actually uh, 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 collaborated or uh, they have these good stakeholder networks with um, leading non-governmental organizations. So that, those kind of partnerships need to be forged, uh, where, where, you know, locally as well as the kind of international partnerships that you were talking about, those also uh, play, uh, you know, they will have a hugely significant role to play going forward. Uh, so however much we try to uh, look inwards, but still this kind of multilateral cooperative agreements and multilateral 
uh, negotiation networks would, would actually play a very important role going forward, at least for achievement of targets such as these, that is the uh, towards moving towards greener infrastructure. And um, I think the governments now should really focus on uh, investments in green infrastructure, which would um, focus on actually reviving the economy through investments in green infrastructure rather than the traditional infrastructure. So more and more the focus should be towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, reducing fossil fuels and going towards uh, the green energy, although we have a long way to go in terms of reducing our um, uh, consumption of uh, uh, fossil fuels, because there's a huge, uh, like uh, Professor Bharti would also agree with me, there's a huge uh, uh, carbon uh, resource that is there untapped in our country. So what do we do with all of that and how do we make it clean? So that those are some of the aspects that need to be focused upon and we, we need to go deeper into the sector to actually come up with policies that would um, help the government of the day to forge ahead with such alliances and the International Solar Alliance, etc. are the very good developments that have happened and very, very relevant, especially in the uh, post-COVID-19 world order. Very rightly said, Ms. Hariharan. We have a long way to go, but still it's good to have a positive attitude. So my next question uh, is for Dr. Bharti. Uh, it is estimated that there's a growing need for solutions to the accelerating process of the ecological collapse of our planet. The narrowing space between the animal kingdom and human settlements have previously and yet resulted in the exchange of viruses and other factors of diseases, and we see the results manifesting as COVID-19. We have arrived at a point where the machinery of international environmental law is needed to cope with the ever, ever more serious challenges by introducing more effective institutional, budgetary, and legal solutions. So while devising treaties, the makers of international law need the signature of as many countries as possible, and therefore in many cases they tend to opt for the least common denominator solutions. Would you say that it's time to do away with the old ways of making law and include basic global environmental interests by codifying them into a new level of international law? When we're talking about uh, the international environmental law, it has generally provided a huge trigger to domestic um, lawmaking. And India is one of the best examples that after Stockholm Conference of 1972, we had uh, so many changes taking place in our constitution and in our statutory framework. Uh, one of the very interesting and positive features of international environmental law is that it has almost done away with the concept of reservations, you know, which is usually a feature of uh, international human rights treaties. So if you're looking at most of the, uh, the newer set of conventions that have come up, you know, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, so whether it's a convention on climate change or the Paris Agreement or, or so many others that are coming up, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity, we do not have the provision of reservation. So yes, the least common uh, denominator or that, that kind of uh, situation is there to maximize participation of countries. But, uh, and, and they, but you know, we have to still retain that framework because in the new post-COVID situation, uh, the countries are not going to be too much forward looking. And as, as has been reflected upon by the other panelists, there is a general trend or tendency of, of inward, uh, you know, uh, looking uh, kind of policies and measures. So there is still a need to um, keep, you know, the, the basic tenets of uh, the environmental values in order to secure them uh, to the maximum. There is a need to uh, at least move forward. And uh, the Paris Agreement uh, which is there, it is one of one of the examples that has come forward where all countries have voluntarily, they have uh, put forward their NDCs. And uh, there are mechanisms now that are being uh, calibrated in order to ensure the smooth working of the transition from the Kyoto to the, uh, to the Paris uh, Agreement. So there is still a long way to go. And uh, despite uh, the, the kind of setback that has suffered uh, we find that uh, the lockdown has also, and the quarantine, these periods that have come up, they have shown, they've given us some uh, breath of fresh air or they've given us some positivity or hope that if the behavior of uh, uh, human beings is changed, you know, to some extent, there can be a lot that can be accomplished. So right now it is a very forced kind of situation due to which carbon emissions, the low, low level of economic activity has seen, low levels of carbon emissions. But it is just hope that this uh, 
kind of interim uh, this this period of uh, is also the period of retro introspection and you know for nations and for peoples on earth and they are able to come up with uh, you know with with kind of behavioral patterns or attitudes or changes in policy you know which which bode well for the environment and and for themselves Uh, so, Doctor Bharti, just follow follow up a question to what you said. Uh, you might have heard about the recently minilateral issue based minilateral uh, formations, uh, uh, which focus mostly currently they focus on the defense sector. But do you find this trend moving into the environmental sector, wherein countries come together to form minilaterals and work on an issue, and then they dilute later? With respect to multilateralism, do you find this trend? Um, being very much relevant after the post covid world order this post covid world uh is that a question to me yes ma'am so okay. just wanted to ask you that do you think like we talked about the doing away of the traditional international law but now we've seen a rise of minilaterals coming together who are working on issues mainly and then they will dilute away so do you find this trend as relevant in the post covid world like what are your views on the minilaterals with respect to the traditional uh, multilateralism and international law yeah the minilaterals they are yes they are an important uh, trend uh, but i i don't foresee if they are uh, you know how how long lasting they may be uh, although i do find that regional networks are going to play a very important role you know so they are also you know when you say international environmental law so it's at the global level and it is at the uh you know at at a more uh you know manageable kind of levels and i think certainly minilaterals and regional networks they would have a uh, uh, predominance you know in in the years to come it, it is it is not going to be easy for uh, the world as a group of nations to you know have that kind of uh you know coming together of countries on common issues is going to become more and more difficult so at least whatever spaces are there uh for any kind of agreement on issues that is always going to be welcome thank you so much for a thoughtful answer ma'am so my next question is to mr singhal in the wake of covid-19 pandemic and its continuing impact on global financial markets executing m&a deals at the right price has almost overnight become more challenging than ever could you quickly highlight for us the trends that you have recently witnessed in the m&a sector of the asian market and also how are companies bridging the valuation gap in the light of covid-19 so i think there are uh, two parts to it one is pre deal and one is post deal uh, pre deal i think we are seeing a lot of uh, skept uh, skepticism or uh, carefulness in ex in executing a deal earlier where uh, there will be a focus on making sure a deal happens within 7 days to a, a couple of months deals are now taking a little longer uh, parties of course start with the same timelines of you know we want to do the deal in one month but it ends up taking a few more months than that the what is time spent on time spent on two things uh, one is doing a more careful diligence uh, second is trying to uh, negotiate clauses which will help you bridge the gap uh, on on the valuation now these are two nature right one is uh, looking for uh, developments and contingency plans in the interim that is before you have the deal closure uh, you know examples are drafting of okay uh, uh, walk away clauses drafting of mac clauses which is material adverse change clauses uh, drafting of stancil covenants uh, which is in interim period covenants on how you the decision making that happens uh, realigning up with the gun jumping issues at cci level so that's one aspect of it i think uh, a primary example was the louis vuitton deal and the uh, uh, tiffany's deal uh, internationally where uh, louis vuitton was supposed to buy out tiffany there was a carefully drafted uh, mac clause uh, in the contract and once the pandemic hit you would not want to walk away and they were not able to because uh, the tiffany the, the tiffany side of the uh, uh, lawyers had negotiated a very ironclad uh, walk away right so they were forced to buy the uh, uh, buy the asset they, could, they couldn't terminate the deal uh, so that is one aspect in which they are taking care of uh, these uh, channels uh, break fees also becoming popular second is uh, uh, establishing uh, valuations post Uh, uh completion and making sure that there is a more robust governance mechanism so order clauses are becoming very popular 
which is uh, promoters are being given the option of giving a, a, a being given a second look at the uh, cherry. They're being given a benefit in terms of either bonuses, ESOPs, uh, uh, you know, six month escrow uh, escrow amounts, which are given a, a, as a subsequent uh, payout. Uh, debit concession issues are becoming uh, uh, challenging for us. They're being dealt with on a daily basis. And second is governance. We, they, there is now a greater impetus to uh, decision making uh, being more uh, democratic, being more uh, inclusive. There is now an, a, a greater focus towards making sure uh, company are becoming more efficient. One of the greatest impacts of COVID has been a shift towards efficiency. We're today working with a minimalistic environment, uh, minimalistic uh, employees, minimalist, minimalistic uh, supply chains. Uh, there has been supply chain disruption. So what you can do in the in the most minimum uh, cost and with the minimum resources available is how you can maintain and, and sustain your growth. So that has become the focus now. Uh, there has been a greater impetus towards buyouts, uh, towards stress assets, towards making sure there is uh, uh, companies which are normally capital intensive and, and low cash crunch are today acquiring companies and startups which have, have solved the problem of liquidity and, and uh, 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 working capital uh, uh, solutions. So I think it's becoming a mix of multiple things. It's not just one item. There's pre-closing uh, or a pre-completion uh, set of uh, protections, then there's post-closing and there's governance mechanism. Thank you so much for your insights. Now we move ahead to our next segment. Uh, that's the question Q and A's from our audience. So our first question here is directed to Ms. Hariharan. So uh, Ms. Hariharan spoke about the policy monoculture. Uh, and the question, the person asking the question is Kritika Kanjio. And she would love to hear your thoughts on whether it was a good idea in the beginning for the government to issue consolidated lockdown guidelines under the Disaster Management Act. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so what I meant by policy monoculture, we shouldn't have is it's on a sustainable basis. We can't have policy monocultures, but when it is required, when it was a national emergency, we really needed to act and the central government had to actually come, come forward and issue this uh, kind of pan India uh, regulation. So I think at that point of time, it was essential, but uh, slowly uh, the government then gave away to the states and the states then to the districts. So we've actually seen leadership at a very, very local level in our country, like district leadership leaderships in districts, district collectors who've been very efficient, they've managed to maintain the, uh, you know, the, uh, they contain the virus within that uh, local uh, jurisdiction. So we've seen policies uh, sifting from uh, pan-Indian to local to, uh, to regional to even very, very local kind of uh, policies that have emerged. And the implementation of these policies, uh, there's a, there was a lot of freedom given to various state governments and to the local leaderships on how to implement these policies as well. Thank you so much for the answer, Ms. Hariharan. The next question is for Dr. Bharti. So uh, the person asking the question is Ms. Uh, Subi. So she is asking, can we please have more elaboration on we have done away with the reservation in international environmental law? That's the question. Okay. Um, so uh, when we are when we are looking at um, uh, treaty making, you know, in the context of international law, uh, there are some uh, characteristic features of uh, treaty, the, the entire process of it. So, of course, the nations come together and they negotiate. There is a process of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the consensus uh, built up, you know, on various uh, provisions. And uh, one of the clauses which is generally incorporated uh, to maximize, again, participation of states is the, the idea of reservation, which whereby a particular provision, uh, the effect of it can be diluted, it can be modified to the extent of the nation's, you know, particular ideologies or its uh, own, you know, existing circumstances. So, you know, like the right to self-determination, for instance, uh, which is part of ICCPR, it has been, uh, there's, there's a reservation that has been made by India. And so that there, there could be a number of, uh, I mean, uh, even the Convention on the Rights of Child or the CEDAW Convention. So uh, most of the human rights conventions, uh, the countries have the prerogative to exercise uh, the, the, the idea of uh, reservation. It's part of the entire, you know, the treaty has a clause to that effect. Uh, so in the uh, environmental scenario, the, uh, the treaties that are there, as, as I particularly pointed out, the Convention on Biodiversity or the Convention on Climate Change, 
So when the state becomes a party to the treaty, it cannot, you know, if, if there is no clause for reservation, then it cannot, you know, the treaty would have its effect in its entirety, and there would be no possibility of, um, you know, modifying its effect, you know, uh, with respect to any particular country. And this spells uh, very uh, favorably uh, for the cause of environment, uh, because, uh, you know, the entire set of conditions or the provisions, they are meant uh, for all the set of nations to work cohesively, collaboratively uh, on those issues. And there is there cannot be any kind of, uh, you know, faltering or lessening the effect, you know, through any kind of reservation that, that might be there. So, yeah. Thank you so much, for <laughs> Dr. Bhati. And now it's time for us to conclude the session. Uh, oh, all right. It's time for us to conclude the session. I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us at the third Indian Law Conclave. But before we conclude, uh, we would like to have a closing remarks from all the panelists. And I would like to start uh, with Dr. Bharti. Right, so uh, when we are looking at the present, uh, literally uh, a very shattering event that has come up and a very disruptive of lives and livelihoods as the present pandemic, uh, there is, uh, there is, of course, cause of concern, and there is, uh, you know, a whole uh, set of events which are presently there, which are more geared towards a kind of emergency uh, responses, you know, uh, on the part of various countries. Uh, but this is also a, a point of time to to uh, understand better. The final nuances of, uh, you know, the of between environment and the rest of the uh, segments of society, and to come up with, uh, you know, concrete policy actions, uh, uh, concrete uh, law, you know, legal measures or reforms, uh, which can which can be, you know, in terms of the sustainable development goals or the United Nations framework on uh, climate change, or whether it is biodiversity. Uh, on all these issues, there is a basic consensus of nations and the strategies are then to, there to accomplish these basic uh, objectives. So uh, it, is, it is rather an imperative at this point of time that uh, all peoples and nations, uh, they are, whether it is at the multilateral level uh, or it is at the regional level or the minilateral, uh, much more targeted, uh, there is a need to, uh, to come up with effective you know, um, kind of packages uh, to, to have uh, a better uh, insight and a better treatment of, of the present situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for such a wonderful closing remark. And now I would like to request uh, Mr. Singhal to give a short takeaway message for our audience. Hi, uh, I think for me, the takeaway is this, uh, that we are now coming out of COVID. There is, uh, we've suffered through a large uh, crisis, uh, which has been not only just a healthcare crisis, but has changed the dynamics of economic and so cultural aspects of how we look at work and uh, economy. But I think this also has given us two things. It has given us a, a forced shift towards greater efficiencies. It has hastened our advent into uh, being more efficient uh, at every step. It has given rise to new opportunities. There is, and in the geopolitical environment of uh, uh, of, of growing tired against China and the need to shift from China, India is rightly placed to take uh, to make the most of the opportunity. If we focus our public policies, we focus our laws. If we focus our energies in the direction of identifying these opportunities, identifying the, that there is today a need for someone to replace China as the manufacturing hub of the world. There is a need to uh, go back to uh, create, uh, to strengthening our fundamentals uh, in the economy, to strengthening the fundamentals of our uh, companies, of our, of our businesses. Then there is a lot of uh, scope for improvement and, and development. Long-term sustainable, uh, sustainability has become the need of the year. We need to be more dynamic in our approach. And I think uh, uh, the government is today uh, doing certain things which are clearly uh, you know, in the right direction. And I think there is, uh, there is an ability for, for all of us to uh, reap benefit of those opportunities. It is up to us to not have a pessimistic outlook 
and see what is really happening. It is not a destruction of an economy or not a destruction of our livelihoods. It's a realignment and reshifting of focuses. So if we can change with the times, I think we will grow and we will develop. But if you are to hold a he uh, head in our hands and, and say, you know, there has been a destruction of what we built so far, then I think we lose opportunities out. Thank you so much once again for your positive statements. And finally, Ms. Hariharan, would you like to conclude the session? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think it's been a very enlightening uh, session and we've heard all viewpoints and uh, uh, Dhruv has been uh, quite optimistic about the investment scenarios and Professor Bharti has given us a very realistic outlook on the uh, way forward as far as the environment is concerned. And uh, as far as the policy measures that go forward that we have to uh, think about going forward, I think there are four uh, measures that call it the IPOA, I've just, I just devised it now, so which is uh, introspection. One is, of course, uh, as every uh, the panelist has agreed, we, this, is, this was the time for introspection. And I hope our uh, decision makers and policy makers have used this time to introspect and uh, look at how uh, we could actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, look at how uh, we could actually prioritize our uh, investments. So the second is prioritization. So prioritizing our uh, funds and budgets and like uh, Dhruv mentioned, there's enough funds available with the private sector, as well as with the government, actually. So it's about prioritizing our uh, budgets and uh, in, in spending towards uh, uh, sectors that matter. And uh, so uh, the, the next is optimization. So I think we really need to optimize platforms, optimize uh, resources. And uh, uh, like uh, the next one would be after optimization would be adaptation. So uh, if, if you combine optimization adaptation, then it's optimizing the digital platforms and adapting digital platforms all the more in various sectors to the extent possible. But of course, not eliminating brick and mortar because brick and mortar is there to stay. Without brick and mortar, there would be no digital platform. So it's, it's about having a, a well-balanced wheel of sorts uh, across these uh, 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 sectors, I would feel. Thank you so much for giving us a new perspective, ma'am. All right, it's time for us to wrap up. I sincerely thank Dr. Bharti, Ms. Hari Haran, and Mr. Singhal for enlightening us and delivering such a thought-provoking session. I would also like to thank the audience for being so patient throughout this session. Lastly, I would like to thank our sponsors, Arnes, the Indian School of Law, Public Policy, and Governance, Vidhi.org, and media partners for making ILC a huge success. The recorded video of this session will soon be uploaded on YouTube. Do not forget to check it out. We will now take a short 10 minute break. Stay tuned for the next session on neutrality of the judiciary in the face of a strong political executive, moderated by my friend and colleague, Pulkit Luda. With this, I, Shubham Bhagat, the vice curator of the Indian Law Conclave, signs off and announce the end of session two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.